As Michael lands on the ground, he is shocked to witness the scene before him and asks, what kind of situation is this? Chan Young shouts to everyone that this is their chance while he's unconscious, and they need to end his life now. While Sun Hoon protests, what the hell was he saying, and Yu Bin shouts questioning, how could he say such a thing? Do Hyun, however, nervously remains silent while carrying his Guild Master sequel over his shoulder. Chan Young adamantly points his finger towards the unconscious body of Giju and shouts, didn't they see how he even attacked his own summons just now, it's too dangerous to leave him alive. Then turning towards Tao Chen and questioned, didn't he also agree? But Tao Chen nervously remains silent. He thought that thanks to Morningstar, they were able to remain alive, and that's the cold hard truth. However, what he said about Morningstar being too dangerous if left alone, was also undeniable. At that moment, El let out a laugh, which astonished the two of them. Getting up from the ground, she questioned them, asking if they have forgotten just who was responsible for keeping them alive right now, and calling them an ungrateful lot. Suddenly, Michael was overcome with an unpleasant feeling of fear. As Elle started to emit her aura, she apologetically thought to her master that she was sorry for acting on her own accord. But right now, she will annihilate all of these ungrateful vermin as she stared at them with eyes filled with murderous intent. Her energy shot out at them, forcing them to defend themselves as Chan Yong grunted from the strain and asked what's with this energy. Even the undead nearby was not spared as the lich called her a crazy bitch for releasing so much energy. Tao Chen also grunted nervously, clearly aware that this bright energy was definitely mana, but this killing intent was. Even Michael was forced to defend himself as he worried for her. Then someone started to step towards her from the crowd of onlookers. Yubin was surprised to notice that it was her elder that was moving forwards against this onslaught of energy. As the elder stepped between Chang Yang and Tao Chen, she quietly approached El, who placed her sword near the elder's throat. She told the elder that she had no intent to attack anyone who doesn't hold hostile intentions, but if she came any closer to her master, she will not show any more mercy than this. But the elder just shifted her head to look at Giju's fallen body, and asked if she was sure this was okay, since leaving things as it is, her master will soon die. At these words, a shocked expression crossed El's face. Then nervously said that she was sprouting nonsense, but the elders countered that she'll know whether she was speaking nonsense or not if she just leaves things as it is, and it'll be too late by the time she realizes the truth. And asked again if she was sure she'll really be okay with that. Suddenly Giju woke up with a shock, he was surrounded by darkness, and wondered what this place was, and where was he? As he looked around, he felt this place was familiar. Then a voice told him that this was the world that one goes to after they die, which surprised Giju, but the voice continued and asked, if that's the stupid thought that he was having right now. Shifting to look around. He asks if this voice was Lu, is this Lu? Then Lu answers him, damn it, there's not much time left, so he'll get straight to the point, he's going to forget everything that happened today, which dumbfounded Giju. But Lu continues to say that he's not confident that he'll be able to endure that extreme void again, and Giju nervously asks him, what was he talking about? So Lu tells him to listen carefully now, that they are, but a sudden sound interrupts his speech. In a panic, Giju shouts that he couldn't hear him, and to repeat what he just said again. As Lu's voice starts to fade, he tells Giju that he feels a void within himself when he's without him. And as Giju's body starts to get smaller and smaller, we see an image of a serpent eating its own tail, an ancient symbol of Ouroboros. In the next moment, Giju finds himself awake again. But this time on the battlefield, as Brunhard tells his master that he was so worried. The elder standing near him asks if he is awake now. As Giju starts to sit up, he replied positive and recalls that this elder is Yubin's advisor. Then he notices the blood stain on his stomach, but his body feels totally fine. Then looking up at the elder, asks if she was the one who saved him, to which the elder simply replies that she didn't do much. If he really wanted to know who saved him, then that would be his subordinate, and Michael who's standing over there. As he turned to look at Michael, he noticed that the mana he sensed from him was significantly lower, even though the battle had already finished, just what in the world happened while he was passed out. But before he could think further, the elder told him that it wasn't over just yet, and told him to come look for her after they get out of this place. As the elder looked over her shoulder at Giju, she thought that this could be Kim Sejin's child. 
and wondered if this really was the son of Kronos. As Giju opened a portal to send his subordinates back, he asked Michael about the fragment of the Holy Grail. And Michael replied that he indeed used a part of the Holy Grail that he possessed and gave it to him. Giju was puzzled, wondering wasn't the Holy Grail something like a wine cup, so how could a fragment of a wine cup enter his body? Lu told him that from what he has heard, that doesn't seem to be the case, it could be a kind of power or something similar. Brunhard agreed, saying that since Michael didn't have anything in his hands at the time, it was something like energy that was transferred, as he recalled that Michael's hand at that time, just glowed with energy. Nervously Gidju asked. Wasn't this the holy treasure of the Vatican? But Michael told him with confidence that, there's no need to make such a face, since it's only just a fragment, so it'll be restored soon and he won't get in trouble either. But then he recalled the recently past events. As tension between the Elder and El came to a boiling point, the Elder told El if she wanted to save her master, she should conserve her powers. Since she has used up a lot of her life power because of the battle, if she wasted any more unnecessarily, she might not be able to save him anymore. Then the elder asked her to trust her just this time, and as their eyes locked onto each other, El was the first to close her eyes and said that she understood, and asked what she needed to do now. The elder asked if she was able to transform into a sword, then do that first. In an instant, El turned into a sword that was held by the elder. The elder looked at the sword in her hands and said that she hoped that she wouldn't misunderstand what she was about to say, but she was going to stab her master with her right now, which shocked El. But the elder told her that there was no need to worry though, since there was no need to create a new wound, as she stared at the already open wound on Giju's stomach. Then the elder turned to look at Michael and called him over. She said that she didn't know his relationship with Kim Giju, but she needed that thing that he had, and asked if he could use that on him. Then in the present, Michael was telling Giju that he still didn't understand, but how did that old lady know about the Holy Grail, and that he had it with him? As he looked at the retreating back of the elder, asked who on earth was she? Giju replied that he wasn't sure himself, since today was the first time he was meeting with her. And he only knows her as the advisor of the Mist Flower Guild. But Michael turned to look at Giju, and said that he didn't really know him either, and at these words, Giju pointed to himself and asked if he was referring to him. Michael continued to say that the only one who's been able to accept the power of the Holy Grail up until now was him, but Giju was able to withstand the power of the fragment without any issues, and even absorbed the power better than him. Just who the hell was he? At these words, Giju recalled the memory of the demon king asking him how did he awaken his demonic eye, since the demonic eye is a symbol of the demon. Then looking up into the sky, said that he wondered that himself and didn't know that either. As Sung Hoon touched the cocoon, the system message asked him if he would like to teleport to the reward room. He then informed all the other players near him that this cocoon was being recognized as being part of the boss, so everyone will be able to teleport to the reward room now. As Giju watched the other players making their exit, he proceeded to touch the cocoon as well. But unlike the others, his system notification asked him if he would like to absorb the gate. After seeing this prompt, he figured that he will have to be the last to leave this gate. Lu remarked that it couldn't be helped, and Brunhardt shouted for everyone to leave quickly so that he could quickly absorb this gate. Looking at his ring, he asked Lu if he really didn't remember anything, to which Lu replied that he has already told him that he'll forget everything again. Well, he actually prepared some measures in advance, and they could talk about that later, this response completely caught Giju off guard, but he said alright, for now he understood. Then asked about L, but Lu told him not to worry, since she simply used up too much life power, and she will recover naturally with time. While he was talking with Lu, someone called his name, and with surprise, he turned to look. He saw Tao Chan and Chanyang with his guild members standing there. As he asked what guild master Chanyang wanted, Chanyang was at a loss with words for a moment. He scratched the side of his head, then closed his eyes in contemplation, then they all bowed their heads as he said thanks. They were only able to survive thanks to him, and on behalf of the Blue Dragon Guild he wanted to say thank you. Giju could only stare at him in stunned silence, and Brunhard warned his master not to be deceived by him, since this guy wanted to kill him, and Lu commented that he would be totally justified even if he insulted his whole family. But Giju told them that there was no need for them to lower their heads, since he was simply raiding the gate. 
As he slowly approached Chanyang who was still bowing, he said in a hostile tone, let's treat everything that happened here like it didn't happen, do you understand? Drips of sweat started to fall from his face, Chanyang replied that he understood. As the last remaining party members left, to teleport into the reward room. Brunhardt asked his master, why did he go easy on him, those people tried to kill him. But Gijiu just let out a long sigh, saying that it's not like he can just kill them, and told Brunhardt not to be influenced by Lu, to which an indignant Lu replied that he didn't say anything though. Gijiu thought that this might be better, since they owe him one now, and he wouldn't be able to fight all of them in his current condition anyways since he hasn't fully recovered yet, plus they had two high rankers here. But Lu remarked that it doesn't take mana to curse or swear at them, but Gijiu just told him to shut it, and Lu indignantly replied that he should have said that to them, not him. Meanwhile outside the gate, the relief troops were getting exhausted from waiting on high alert. Then suddenly they noticed a change in the gate, and everyone started to gather in front of it. As the players started to exit the gate, someone shouted in excitement that they cleared the gate, and the raiding party was back. There were also a lot of casualties, so transport them to the hospital after performing emergency care on them. Pil saw his cousin being carried by Dong He and approached them, his guild members also asked about the whereabouts of Giju, but suddenly something caught their attention, as someone shouted to look over there at the back. The area of the gate started to glow brightly. Sometime later at the player association building, Giju was taking a shower. He thought that in the end, he wasn't able to find out why Sequa was kidnapped, and not killed, or what he was after. Lu remarked that they can just ask him personally, since he's been egified. To this Giju was surprised, and asked if that happened while he was unconscious. Lu replied that yeah, he ate him. With a bewildered expression, he commented that he was just asking this for reference, but when he said he ate him, it was figurative right. Lu replied him, no, he meant he literally ate him, and Brunhardt pitched in shouting that he ate him with such gusto. After hearing all this, he just stood there with a perplexed expression, searching for an answer. He soon entered the room with a toilet, then looked at his left hand which had two fingers raised together. Then looked at the toilet, and sounds of someone forcefully throwing up could be heard coming behind closed doors. Back at his house, his sister was sitting on the couch with Rain in her arms. Rain isn't just any regular dog, anyone who isn't an idiot would know that. Whenever her brother would leave for work, he'll take Rain along. There are times when he'd forget to bring Rain back, and would go back out to fetch it back. While she was holding Rain up, she said it's probably a player's summon. She couldn't hold back from hugging Rain to her, and wanting to protect it from going to dangerous places, but if doing so will endanger her brother's safety, then she couldn't really say anything about it. She closed her eyes, and came to a serious decision. She would make him tell her the truth today. And he shouldn't have to keep hidden the fact that Rain wasn't a normal dog this whole time. Then she marched purposefully to his room, opened his door wide and shouted to her brother. Then was shocked at what she saw, her brother was lying completely disheveled in bed. As she looked at his face, he looked very exhausted. After a moment of silence, she covered her brother with the blanket, and quietly left the room. Giju had no idea what just happened, since he was deeply sleeping due to his exhaustion. Later that night, he was woken up, due to a phone call from Sung Hoon. As he sat up in bed, he picked up the phone, and the other party asked him to have dinner together with Yu Bin. And he agreed to do so. Still trying to wake up, he told Sung Hoon that he'll head over once he washed up. After hanging up the phone, he noticed that the time was already 6 p.m., since he got back around 10 a.m., he must have slept for around 8 hours. However, Lu told him that he got it wrong, that he had been asleep for more than 30 hours, a whole day had passed by, to which Giju was fibbergasted, and Brunhardt commented that his master was such a sleepyhead. Giju protested and said they should have woken him up, but Lu and Brunhardt countered that rest was important. Then Lu remarked as a side note, that his sister came by to check on him to make sure he was still alive, and Giju shouted that they should have woken him up then. Later in a restaurant, the three of the ate together. As he ate, he asked them where Guildmaster Choi was, since it would have been nice if he had joined them as well. Sung Hoon told him that Choi has been busy handling the deaths that his guild had experienced, and since the Kane Guild suffered quite a bit of casualties, it seems they're preparing a combined funeral with the Blue Dragon Guild. Then sweating profusely, he asked Yubin if her guild was alright, Yubin replied that no one on her side had died. 
with a gloomy expression. He said that it was a relief, but Lu questioned why he was suddenly so down, since death is a common occurrence. Sun Hun while eating said that it was good that they were able to clear the gate quickly, since they didn't know when the other gates would be cleared, they couldn't even begin to estimate just how many casualties there'll be. Geju questioned the other gates, and he replied yes, the only gate that has been cleared is the Gangnam Station Gate. While Geju was anxiously thinking about Taishik, Yubin called his name which jarred him out of his thoughts, as she asked him if he was thinking of entering other gates right now. Even Sung Hoon said that it would be tough, even for him. But Gidju protested no, he didn't even say anything about that. Lu reminded him that it'd be impossible for him to join fights in his current condition, unless he just had a death wish, Brunhard also told him that he really needed to rest, and Gidju could only relent saying that he understood them. Then suddenly changing the subject, asked how was Sequo doing. Sun Hoon told him that Ranker Sequo still had not woken up yet, he doesn't have any external injuries, but for some unknown reason, he's not regaining his consciousness, and they also don't know what the demon did to him inside the gate, currently he's recovering under strict supervision in the association's treatment center. He remained silent after hearing this, with a somber expression. Lu asked him why he was looking so dazed, since all they said was that they didn't know what the demon did to him, then he just needed to ask the demon then, calling him an idiot. A flash of insight came into his eyes, upon hearing this. Later after returning home, he created the gate within his basement and entered it. The elder greeted him upon arrival, and told him that he was has been waiting for him. Then asked if he came for this correct, while showing him a huge hole on the ground. The elder commented, first it was a floating island, and this time it's underground, and he was curious to find out how big this will become, and Brunhardt replied that it might become way bigger than Earth. Gidju nervously apologized and said it must have been very troublesome for him to manage all these, but the elder replied that he was actually liking it, since the bigger the area, the more satisfaction he got from managing it. In any case, he'll take his leave first, since the administrator can't be away from his position for too long. And after saying his goodbyes and left Gidju alone. As Gidju looked around, he couldn't help but laugh at what he saw, he recalled that this was originally a pyramid that Rogers made, but what has he been doing with it, as he looked upon the construction of a building still in progress? While Lu called the old man crazy, Brunhardt said that his dad was amazing. Soon, Gidju teleport to another area with the remains of the gigantic cocoon. Gidju looked at it and said that it's just as Lu said, it's still here. Bodhi's corpse, and Lu said that it's obvious, since in a territory war, the winner takes everything in the opponent's territory after all. As Gidju approached the corpse, a prompt asked him to choose the designated ego. And he assigned Bodhi's ego, the gigantic corpse started to glow with a blue aura. Then suddenly, silk threads started to form around the corpse, and turned it back into a cocoon. Then as he watched, the cocoon quickly shrank in size. After shrinking to the size of a normal body, the silk threads started to fall apart, revealing a form that was kneeling before him. Bodhi's was still kneeling on the ground, as he said that he was paying respect to his king. Brunhardt said that he now looks more like a human now. But Lu asked if he was blind, and couldn't see that head of his. Gidju just greeted Bodhis, and said it was nice to meet him, and said he was sorry to do this right after his resurrection, but he needed something from him. Bodhis obediently asked to be given his orders, from his king. While rolling up his sleeves, Gidju said that first of all, he needed to take a beating, and changed Oberon into its gauntlet form, which completely shocked Bodhis. He nervously asked in fear, my king. In reply, Gidju said he was sorry, but he had a friend whom he owed a huge debt to, and Lu started to laugh maniacally. Gidju continued to tell him not to worry, since he won't be too harsh on him, but sweat started to drip from Bodhis' face. As he tried to speak but only ah, ah came out. Then as sounds of punching among screams of agony was heard, Lu shouted that he was doing a great job, while Brunhardt praised his master for being great at everything he did. Subscribe to the channel for the next part. Thank you for watching, until next time.